Uh, for those of you last week, or last month, you'll remember that I attempted to do a bit of a demonstration with uh, Laura Wan. Just to give you a, a bit of a summary, um, I spoke briefly about the Laura Wan technology, which is low speed, wide area radio communications network. Uh, there's a thing called the Things Network, which is actually used for uh, essentially taking data from lots of more WAN connections, consolidating that over the web internationally, and then pushing that out to wherever you want to pump it to. We have a more WAN gateway, which is a white box on the front of the rack you see up there. I've also bought an extra one, because I had trouble last time trying to connect to our Laura WAN gateway. So I've got a separate one that's actually sitting over on the bench over there behind us, which is actually good for demonstration, because what I'll be able to demonstrate today is to show how that device, which is actually a LoRa device, how it actually hands off between two gateways and how the contention actually works and how, that, how, how the system essentially um, figures out which gateway has got the best signal strength and takes data only from that gateway and uses that data only. So in an environment where you've got a wide area network, we've got lots of devices all trying to communicate via lots of gateways, it's important that you don't get duplication of data when you've got messages going around the network. So that's what the TDN system basically does. So it's got a bunch of servers all over the place for all that. So just going through this, uh, just to give you a bit of an understanding about where we are. Um, last time, you'll remember, I put this map up, which is the map of all the connections around the world of all the, all the gateways. If you recall, I zoomed in on Melbourne uh, and I could basically get down to where we are, which is this little one here, which is us. Right? So that's the gateway that's physically sitting here. Um, I have another couple of gateways which are actually sitting out at my place, which is here somewhere. So these two gateways are actually my own personal gateways. One of them has actually been relocated here from the city. So, um, so it's not real. The position isn't actually a, a live um, the position is actually not live, it's not GPS driven, it's just purely a map coordinate that I put in at the time. You, so can you actually, didn't just tell everyone where you lived, did you? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there won't be any concern there. You come back to the No. <laughs> One of the things I want to show you on this page is down the, is this little drawing here. Actually, quite important. So, this gives you a bit of understanding about what the network actually looks like. So, little boxes on the left hand side of the gateway devices, they're all talking back to a gateway server, or actually a number of gateway servers. So, there's different gateway servers around the world. So, it's, as far as the, the gateways are concerned, it's just an IP address. So, each, IP, each gateway is configured with an IP address that actually sends that gate, data to and gets instructions from in regard to how it tra handles the data going through the network. And then the data is basically sent you know, through the network or through the TDN network and then gets handed off using one of these protocols to some other visualisation tool. So your application you end up writing is written in a, a tool like Node-RED, which I'll give you a bit of a... Um, so you might write, a, write something in Node-RED, which is... Well, I'll give that a second. So for those that aren't familiar with Node-RED, Node-RED was a tool originally developed by IBM. And it's, it's essentially sort of, it's, it's like a, um, a flowchart sort of tool where you basically you know, select boxes from this left hand side based on different input types, different output types, and it supports you know, Sigfox and TTN and there's all sorts of things that people have written previously which you can just physically just pick up, drag across, drop in the middle of here and you connect things up with these lines to basically make things happen. So this particular application we're looking at here is one that actually takes data from that device 
and then essentially creates a user interface, which is this. So that's just a quick demo. So it's basically displaying battery level, it's displaying water level, that's actually transmitting. Um, and it's, it's also got this test gauge over here, which is driven just off that main screen. So the actual main screen, these, these are buttons down this left hand side, so they're test buttons. So if we want to actually test something, for instance, we hit the test button here, go back to that, we'll see we've now updated that page. Right. Uh, if we want to change that value to another test button and set it to a different value, it's back down with the value. Now I've also got test nodes for generating non-alarm situations and alarm situations, so I can test my code before that even starts to communicate. So just to get that operating, we send a a non-alarm situation that will have actually changed the water level, changed the battery levels. So it's not real data come from that device at stage. And we can also go and test an alarm one. That was the wrong one, sorry. That was the wrong one. It's also got an audio announcement as well. Right? Okay. So there, so these these icons we see down here are, are where you actually set up. So if I actually click on that, it gives you a bit of detail about what it is, an audio alarm. Um, you can uh, script up what you want it to say. It does the synthesized voice. Um, you can also pop up messages on the actual dashboard. So on the actual dashboard itself, there should be a message in the middle as well, in case we've had an alarm. So what I want to do next was now try and connect to a little sit and show you what that's doing at stage. I'll try and get up another screen simultaneously so we can actually visualise the data running around the network. So I can't help but notice you got like a syringe plugged in your device. Oh, uh, that's there deliberately. Yeah. Uh, the device you're looking <laughs> at there, the list, <laughs> maybe you're going a little bit. That is, that is actually uh, a variation of an existing device I already have, which is a device I call Dipstick, which is basically a flood monitoring product. So it normally sits on the top of a post, uh, sits on the top of about a 3.2 metre post in the beside a creek or in a retarding basin owned by a council, uh, and it's measuring water levels within inside the mountain post. The way it's measuring the water level in the mounting post, it's using pressure, hence the syringe. So rather than bringing a post and water bucket and all the rest of it, it's just the <laughs> syringe and just sort of fabricate the rising water level. So that's the idea. So once we get this set up, I will be able to sort of fabricate all that for you. What we're looking at at the moment this is the console. If you're a, an, an owner of either devices on the Things Network or gateways on the Things Network, you access the Things Network <coughs> via console by your own user console. So I've got gateways and applications that are running. So if we go to the gateways page, you can see all the gateways I'm managing. Obviously this is the hackerspace one here. But this one that says ban is in fact my temporary gateway I've got stuck over in the corner. And this one is actually my home. So if we actually go to this is on the screen here. If we go to here we can actually click on the traffic button. And we can actually see messages as they're coming from that device and hitting both of the gateways. Yeah. So what I'll do is I want to actually get both gateways up here. If I can do that for us. <coughs> so it's a bit painful, unfortunately. It doesn't remember all the tabs. I had all the tabs open before and for whatever reason it crashes. Uh, so I've got to actually re open every one of them again, which is a real nuisance. So I was going to actually raise tabs for each of the gateways. And the reason I'm doing this, which I'll explain a bit more detail later on, is that for each one. Okay, one more. This last tab is actually going to be associated with the actual application which is the actual part of the Things Network that's hiving off 
the data to that um, node red page that I showed you before. So we got to see the traffic goes there. Now the big thing about this, this will actually show us Set this and fire it back up again. And this will go through the motions now of actually reacquiring connection to the gateway. It'll try to find one of the gateways in the area, and you'll see the lead on the front there goes from orange to green when it actually makes the connection, which is done. So it's now connected to a gateway. So we should now see on here, we've got a message, it's actually gone through from the device which is actually the application message or the device activation message. So you should have those gateways. No one. So the data we've got on the screen at the moment is telling you a little bit about the LoRa protocol. It's showing what frequency it's running at. It's telling you essentially what band it's running at in that package. This next lot of data here is the gateway ID that's actually responded and actually authorised this connection to the network. Which is the new Michael gateway sitting over the corner over there. Um, and it also gives you signal minute levels, signal noise ratio, etc. The network uses that information to determine which gateway. I have a feeling you have the same gateway. I think they're both. I've done some of the same one. seen there, the first message that actually went through is the connection request, join request going out from the device, out to the gateway. The other one that came back sometime later is the join accept message coming back from the things network gateway saying, yep, no worries, this device is authorised on the network, you can join, and away it goes. So you'll see they're running at different frequencies, so the join request went out at 917.5, the join except comes back at 923.9. So the way the network is set up, uh, it runs in the ISM space, which is from 915 through to 928 megahertz is the band that's using. Within that band, the the Australian standard has 64 individual data channels that can be used. Each of these gateways here can only support eight. So in their wisdom, what the Things Network has done, has said, okay, for Australia, we'll use the second block of eight channels for public community access in that, that space. So other people can use other blocks of eight. So ten, potentially you have eight separate different blocks. A complication that gives with devices when they attempt to register on the network is they never know which particular frequency, which particular channel to talk to, which can be quite frustrating. So if you've got a device that only sends out one join request and then doesn't send a join request for some time, it might take you a bloody long time before your device joins the network. So there's been a little bit of, I don't know, disheart, it's, it's interest around the things network community about what Australia really should be using, what channels we should be using, what bands we should be using, and there's been a bit of a push also to, to use the Asian frequency allocation, which is a little bit simpler in its join request. So if you're interested in LoRa, I certainly have a read of that. But from from your perspective, you're developing devices to hook onto the LoRa system here, for instance, just concentrate on using the standard TTN channels, which is sub-band 2 in the Australian Now, unfortunately, my device is only sending out data every minutes. 
realize we've got bad again. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to. It's, it's going to take too long to show you what actually happened. What, what, what I was going to try and show you is that if you look at the, if you actually get into the, the actual data that's coming from the device, when you've got multiple gateways on it, within this area, you see the application data, it shows the responses from multiple gateways. So if you've actually sent a message to the system, to the network, and two gateways pick up that data, they'll both post that data back to the TTN server. So when the TTN server sends that data through to your application, it actually sends information about both packets from both gateways. But at least it posts that on your console, but when it actually goes to your application, only then takes the gateway that's got the highest signal strength. So you don't get duplication of data. So that's the way it actually does the, the handoff from one gateway to another. So if you've got a device that's moving around and moving between gateways, it can quite happily go from gateway to gateway to gateway and pick up the highest signal strength. In terms of... Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? We're going to have to get a move on time-wise? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, that's great. Um, well, one of the things we want to do is, if someone's just sort of hold that, I'm going to hold, someone just hold that down, right? We should see that go all the way through to this dashboard. Might take a while. Unfortunately, there's a cycle of 10 minutes. Now we've been. Just hold that for 10 minutes. We've, 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 it should be 10 minutes. It should not be with 10 minutes. So I should be able to give you a rough idea where it's going to come through. <laughs> so this join went through at 2106. Okay. So who says that you do? How often? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's a fair use policy in the Laura community. If if you if, if everyone hooks onto Laura and starts sending lots and lots of data, it's just going to clog the network up. But the data rate's relatively slow. You're talking about small packets of data, you know, 50, 60 bytes sort of data, maybe a couple hundred bytes tops. Uh, and fair use use policy is, is essentially says you send that sort of data about once every ten minutes. Uh, if you're using Sigfox, which is another commercial operators operating a similar sort of technology, their data uses is a lot tighter. You can only send 12 bytes every 10 minutes. So law isn't too bad, but hey, they're sorry, likely you're to change it. Sorry. <laughs> Are they likely to change it on you? Are they likely to change that? Yeah. No, it's governed by the technology. The technology you just tap the capability to send the data. No meaning could they reduce it? Could they turn around and say you you cap now with 30 bytes every 10 minutes? Like could they Unlikely. Um, no, no, it's not. It's not likely to get reduced. Yeah, you know, look, we we've only got a few devices on a gateway or in an area. You can send a lot more frequently. It's not a problem. You know, every couple of minutes it would be a drama. But yeah, you know, for most applications, when you're trying to do things like monitoring garbage collection in bins or or water levels for flood monitoring gear, you know, once every ten minutes is quite adequate. Applications, you know, parking sensors in the road. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot of parking sensors now that are coming out with more connection doors, that sort of load tech type communications. I'll try and get up those other ones. Parking sensors is a way to <coughs> inhibit Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Block 915. Yeah, <laughs> just just lots of messages and oh, okay. totally, yeah. totally swamped the band. Yeah, yeah, right. so yeah because, because it's a public so band, it is the ISM band. Just yeah, it's cool. Coil and a relay. And just wipe you be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, wipe them all out. That's exactly right. You might have Ackman sort of chasing if you did a lot of that. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, realistically, the whole idea about the ISM space is there for public and community use. But if you abuse it, then uh, yeah, the police come down on here, which is that much. So it's protected by ACMA. ACMA protected, yeah. yeah. But look, being honest, they've got limited resources. <laughs> yeah. You've got other commercial operators that are more important than worrying about public space. So. I'm going to try and get those ones from this one again. I'll show you what's in the
Okay. That's that's that it's actually gone all the way through oh from that, right through to the gateway, across to the servers, which actually happen to be sitting over in over the other side of Europe somewhere. Um, and then all the way back to my server in Singapore where this is running and all the way back to the place. Right. So yeah. End to end. Worked. Okay. Any questions? I know I've run through it pretty quickly and I've had a couple of screens that didn't quite go as I planned. But. For those of you that are interested in Laura, Peter's around, he's keen to talk about it, so um, yeah, yeah, pick his brain. I'm keen to encourage um, a, 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 you know, a, a body of people to get together and actually start to get Laura and MicroPython happening. Uh, I am using MicroPython on that product, but it is a bit of a corruption, as Damien quite happily will say. Um, <laughs> I'm using a PyCom device currently. Uh, I've had mixed experience, I'll be honest, with PyCom from a supplier point of view. But uh, so I'm keen to actually see something else happen in, in the space and be able to use other devices that have more and MicroPython on one device. So. How many of these did you make? That is the only one I have. <laughs> I have other devices of those deployed, but not using MicroPython. The devices that are currently in the field are all PIC based. And not Laura as well, they're all GSM? They're all using, well, the, the purple thing on the back is a GSM. Yeah. So, so you're looking to upgrade the system? Is that the. I want to get rid of the motor from the start because yeah. that's problematic to me. Yeah. Uh, the plans are expensive, yeah. data's expensive, yeah. and I want to actually be able to control that. So my vision is to be able to actually go in and actually either work with a partner to deploy a network, a LoRa network in an area, or go in and sell the gateways as part of the total solution and deliver the entire package to a council or particularly my client's councils, uh, and then allow them to put other applications onto that. What's the dis distance with LoRa again? Uh, it varies a little bit. It depends a little bit on the on the gateway. It depends on your antennas. It depends on your devices. But typically, you know, two and a half, five k, somewhere in that sort of area, line of sight, line of sight. I have actually tested you know, my gateway at home with uh, not that device, but with another node, and I've run it quite happily from the top down. Then back down to the gateway. It's about twenty k. But it has to be line of sight, though. Yeah. That can be anything but line of sight, but so obviously line of sight is going to give you your optimal like communication. There are, um, find the, there are various different records that are on their front page. But it's a bit further than mine. There you go, here you go. This is their, the current Laura claim in terms of their communication record. <laughs> <laughs> What? Between yeah. two points? That would have been I some think, fairly I think directional the areas. node was on a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> what type of power source? It's still the LoRa technology, so it's still uh, 22, 30 odd DBM. It's not exactly you like that. You can't increase that, but you can put directional antennas on it. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, they run, yeah, they run directional antennas and you know, both ends and and I think the you know the node was on a balloon, so it's all line of sight, you know, good pick up, all the usual stuff. But still, it's 700 odd kilometres at you know 200 odd milliwatts power. It's pretty good. Pretty good. So, so yeah. So if anyone's interested in the technology, I'm happy to sort of help out, and encourage people to you know, come in here and develop things. You know, once we've got a generic MicroPython with a uh, Laura Wayne it's stack, we're in business. <laughs> Great. <It's gonna> <laughs> so, so what do you what do you need? You, you've got you want to, you've chosen that hardware, or do you want? Or I've you chosen that hardware way? purely because that today delivers what I need to, for me to write application code on. Okay. 
<coughs> so so it's, python, it's micropython based. Yeah. Slight corruption of what micropython is from now. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have all the features that micropython currently has, but has some extra bits which are all the stack interfaces to handle LoRaWAN, Sigfox, and NBIoT and CAT M1, Can which are all the, the four major IOC communication technologies that are emerging today. Can you get a, like a module that you can plug in something which is uh, standard? Well, that is a module. That, the PyCon so, device there is a module. And you can get other modules like the one I showed you earlier, yeah. um, which is the one that's over on the desk over here. So this is a Chinese, and I showed this to people last year. This is a, this is a Chinese Heltec device. Um, there's TD Goes and there's a few others, and you've got some as well, I think, Matt. There's a number that's sort of cropping on the marketplace now. This has actually got uh, essentially an ESP32 on it. This one also has an OLED display, which is really cute. So it's really cute for getting stuff up and going and getting all your debug messages out. So you can actually debug on you. Um, and also, obviously, an antenna and a LoRaWAN IC on the back. So if it's got ESP32, yep. you can put MicroPython on it, is that right? It will run MicroPython. You can yeah. install MicroPython on it today. Yes. What MicroPython doesn't currently have in its native format, which PyCon obviously solves, doesn't have a LoRaWAN stack in there. So you can't, you haven't got the code to drive the SX 1276 or 1278. And so you could write that in Python? You could uh, write the code in that? Yeah. Or you can yeah. port across the C version, which is already running on Arduinos. Which is what this code is. And then you can code. create, but you can create your own C module for MicroPython. Yeah. yeah. If you're so inclined. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you're so inclined. You're not going to just check yeah. the one from Python. To but that's yeah. that's what. Well, you can't it's easily get the Python one. Different license. Because it's different license. Oh, here's Dave. Just in your focus. Although it's open source. Yeah. That's the problem. Oh, because it's a different license, that was where the complication came. However, I, I believe that they've all come, all taken the port from the Arduino uh, and then cut it across. So I don't think it's complicated code because most of the no. stack runs on the SX chip. Yes, yes, it does. So Correct. I think it's really just the yeah. few commands you just send to the and receive. Exactly right. Yeah, but unfortunately, it's beyond my skill. Uh, so right. yeah. so I put my hands up. So that oh. sheet, it's not, it's not <laughs> rocket science. That, that particular chipset's exposing a lot of functionality of LoRa, so there are a lot of buttons and knobs that you have to fit on. You probably don't need most of it, so it's, I think it's the thing that said, it's probably pretty pretty easy to do in the simple case. Mm -hmm. um, could do it with Python? Yeah, 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 yeah no, I think because the so bandwidth is so low, I don't yeah, think there's exactly. any reason why... Yeah, there's no reason why you could Python. Python. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, there's a talk about SPI, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's an SPI interface. You could write a pure Python oh, driver for it. Yeah, it would be a good start to yeah. do that. Yeah, because then you could do it. Easily. Look, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to help in terms of sort of I suppose test actors test case and and help. But I, when it comes to actually writing the code, and, you know, that's it's gone beyond my I'm paper. Some right. I'm happy to help people too. So <laughs> yeah, different levels if they want to get involved. Yeah. Um, it's not quite at the top, but it's getting closer. No, so, no, I understand yeah. that, but. I think the other advantage is because, because we've got an environment here that allows us to you know, debug and we've got a gateway here that works. Um, although it's not for whatever reason, it's not allowing that to register, I don't know why. So, okay, so we've got the infrastructure for testing and what you Yeah, correct. Yeah, the idea was ultimately too, to look, you know, ultimately when I was talking to Andrew about, Andrew about it, we'll throw a, an antenna up on the roof here, uh, which will allow people over in Swinburne University or wherever to actually so it creates a gateway in zero. So anyone that's living within a couple of k's shouldn't have a problem, should be able to access it. But at the moment, the antenna's still inside, still hard up against that enclosure. But I must admit, that's got pretty good signal strength out of that. When I was looking at signal strength earlier, it's actually quite quite good, quite strong. So you'd probably be able to get it. If you're in the neighbouring houses, in the street out front, you'd probably pick it up. No problem, so. Thanks, Peter. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.